Uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon. Buenas uh, tardes. Thank you all for, for coming and, uh, to this uh, week's uh, community seminar. It's a pleasure for me to uh, be able to introduce uh, Francesco Mandarabai, uh, Speaker Basque Fellow here since uh, 2018. Um, let me say a, <coughs> a few quick words. He graduated from the University of Valencia in 2014, uh, moved to the University of Texas at Arlington, um, and uh, came, uh, came back to Spain, I guess, to be the coordinator of the next project uh, in 2015. Uh, has been responsible for the construction and commissioning and operation of the next white detector in Canfranc and uh, has been here since uh, almost four years now. Uh, first as a postdoc, later as an Ecolast Research Fellow and uh, was awarded a DRC uh, starting grant uh, this year to develop, uh, I think, the things he also will talk about now. So please, do you want to ahead? Thank thanks, Geta, for the introduction. And uh, thanks, the APC, for organizing the seminar so we can um, see each other without the mask and such. So I'm going to talk uh, first about who we are in the group, uh, but I'm going to focus on detector technology. And uh, what we do in our group is mostly uh, high pressure gases uh, TPCs for neutrino physics. But uh, as you will see in a second, uh, we have uh, other projects. So I'm trying to give a, a perspective of what we do in our group, the neutrino groups at the, at the IPC. Uh, but I will focus only in this part of the technology. So first of all, of, of all the most important part of our group is the people. And I basically divided it in two blocks. These are the technicians or engineers. Uh, many of them are here now. And this part here is the students, postdocs, uh, support people and leader of, of some of the, of the groups. And here are the less important people who are the PIs, uh, JJ, Paola, and myself. Uh, probably many of you know us, uh, but the people that needs to be known is these guys here, well, these guys and girls here. So about the projects, uh, what I was saying is that we have uh, different projects, most of, most of them based on high pressure gas uh, TPCs. And all, all this started with uh, a project called Next, and which is a uh, high pressure xenon uh, TPC that uh, is looking for double beta decay without neutrinos. Uh, what you can see here is the, is the next Y detector. And as I will explain later, this is the, the vessel of NES 100 and parts of the NES 100 detector. This technology is also evolving into larger and larger detectors. What you can see here is our concepts for the tone scale detectors of uh, you know, looking for the double beta decay. And this project here is uh, the next world project that uh, in, with which JJ, uh, Fernando Cosillo, and Roxanne Genet obtained a near C synergy grant uh, one year ago. This is uh, another project based in, the, in a very similar technology, also gaseous uh, TPCs. This is the project uh, which I am, uh, you know, 50% of my time now, uh, which is called uh, GANES. And it's basically using the gaseous TPCs for looking for coherent scattering. This is another project I will talk uh, today, but uh, we have added other projects into our interest. Uh, the, one of the most important ones is uh, hyper Candle, which is uh, a neutrino detector to basically observe neutrinos uh, from a beam and to measure neutrino oscillations, but also to do neutrino astronomy. So this is uh, the, an intermediate step between the current uh, neutrino detectors and the super large ice cube detector. And this will allow us to observe supernova neutrinos and do uh, astrophysics neutrinos. On top of the neutrino detectors, we have uh, what we call um, a startup project. And this is Petalo. This is led by Paola Ferrari. And this is basically use uh, the Xenon technology applied to medical physics. And what we want to do is to create a full body PET based on liquid Xenon. And this is the prototype, the prototype that is uh, currently being operated in Valencia because it's where we had a space. And the idea with this technology is that we are able to reconstruct uh, two, two gammas back to back and then reconstruct the images of the, of the tumors and the organs that are in the, in the center of the detector. As I said, uh, I'm not going to focus on this detector, so I, 
invite uh, Ricardo and the APC to invite Paola to talk about, about this project because it's very interesting. But I'm going to focus on neutrino physics and detector neutrinos. So this is basically what I'm going to talk, neutrinos, how to detect neutrinos, uh, well, how to not detect neutrinos, but I'm going to focus mostly on the kind of detectors that, uh, that we do, and uh, what happens in, in our detectors and why we need to do what we, what we do. And then I will talk about the detectors the, that, that we want to operate. So let me talk very briefly about, uh, about neutrinos. Uh, I don't know how much you know about neutrinos, but they are basically uh, the tiniest particle of the, of the standard model, this uh, ghost here. This, this is the, an artistic representation of the standard model. And the key of the neutrinos is that they are a particles that interact only with it. So they have no color. They don't interact uh, with, the, with the strong force. And they have no electric charge, so are you know super is, is, are almost invisible. What we knew, what we have learned in the last uh, twenty five years, is that uh, there are only three light neutrinos. Where light means that the the mass of the neutrinos has to be less than half of the of the mass of the zeta z zero boson. And uh, we know that from from accelerator uh, physics. And we know that we have those three flavors that are pairing to each one of the, of the other leptons, the, the electron, the muon, and the tau. So we have a neutron, uh, electron neutrino, uh, sorry, an electron neutrino, a, tau, a muon neutrino, and a tau neutrino. And we have been able to detect all of them. In addition, we know that the neutrinos are the, the particles that, that uh, are more numerous in the, in the universe, just outnumbered by, by photons. And actually, for every, every centimeter square of our body, are crossing about 100 neutrinos per flavor per second. So we are you know, constantly being uh, with, with a constant flux of neutrinos through our body. But because of the only interact weakly, basically none of those neutrinos will interact with ourselves. So don't worry, neutrinos are harmless. Uh, what we Another important thing that we have learned about neutrinos is uh, that they do oscillate. And the fact that they oscillate implies that they have mass. They, they, are, they are massive. And that implies that uh, this is the, the, the first uh, result of physics beyond the standard model that we got since we constructed the standard model uh, 40 years ago. And this is what uh, has opened a lot of new questions on the neutrino cycle. So these questions, or some of these questions, are the, the most important one probably is what is the identity? Are they Dirac or are they Majorana fermions? And this is only important because they have mass. Otherwise, this question will be irrelevant. Uh, also, we don't know what is the absolute mass scale of the, of the neutrinos. We know the, mm -hmm. the differences be, uh, between uh, the three of them, but we don't know uh, what are the, the absolute value of the mass of the neutrinos. We have limits, we know that it has to be less than one electron volt, actually less than probably 200 electron volts from cosmology, but we uh, are not able to measure this mass in, in, a, in a laboratory. Again, uh, about uh, mass uh, neutrino oscillations, we know the separation between two of them, but there are uh, there is a sign on the on the separation that we don't know. So we don't know if, uh, you know, if uh, this is the, the normal ordering or, or is the, the inverted order. And then there are a few other questions like the CP phase. Uh, we expect that the CP phase has to be violated, but we don't know. And um, that's uh, the objective, one of the main objectives of the Hyper-K uh, detector that we are building. And actually this is related with the fact that uh, the question if, if neutrinos uh, follow the, the arrow of time, uh, because Maybe you know, but CPT has to be conserved. So if CP is violated, it implies that T is also violated. So this question here uh, is related with the, uh, the with the conservation of the time uh, symmetry. And then there are other questions that are uh, mostly worked by phenomenologists, which is if they are external neutrinos. We we, are, we have some results on some detector neutrinos that we do not understand with the current uh, you know, structure of the, of the neutrino family. And some uh, theoreticians are speculating with adding extra neutrinos to it so they can fit the data. I have my opinion about that that I'm not going to share. <laughs> anyway, 
So let, let's talk about the uh, detectors. Uh, those are the, the ones that I like most. Uh, this is the first uh, the detectors, the, the one by Reynes and Cowan, that where they made the first observation of neutrinos coming from a, from a nuclear reactor. Uh, this is um, another uh, crazy story. This, this one is, is Davis. Uh, he was a chemist and he proposed to build a, a swimming pool this is the, the detector he, he proposed to build. This is something like uh, 40,000 or 40,000 gallons, so something like 100,000 liters of, uh, of blends of uh, detergent. Uh, put it in, in under the mountain and then wait uh, a couple of weeks and then filter the whole liquid and check for, uh, for radioactive argon. He was trying to count 10 atoms of argon every, every two weeks. And what he was trying to do is to measure the neutrinos that come from the sun. And he was doing that for 20 years, but instead of measuring 10 atoms of argon, he was measuring three. And he was going to all the, all the conference and saying, guys, I expect to, to see 10 atoms and I am only seeing three. What is happening here? Of course, nobody trusts the, I mean, everybody thought that the experiment was wrong because you, know, you are filtering hundreds of thousands of liters and you know, it, can, it cannot work properly. And you have only a factor of three. So you know, do, do the maths again, do everything again, you are wrong. The problem is that he was right. And that was the, the discovery of, that, the, that the neutrinos oscillate. So this is one of the big heroes in the, in the neutrino history. And then the bottom, the, the picture that you have on the, on the back side of the slide is an image of the previous uh, detector to the Hyper-K, the super chemical detector. And just for you to have a, an idea of how large is it, this is 40 meters uh, detector. What you can see here is people. It's people that is uh, repairing the, the PMTs and working on the, on the PMTs that are uh, 20 inches uh, size. So, uh, and with that, is what with the detector that we are able to see uh, a neutrino from the sun with very large statistics. Actually, such large, large statistics. So, you know, this is a better picture of the of the people uh, working on the PMDs. And with this detector, we have so large statistics that we have been able to take pictures of the nucleus of the sun. Just in case you haven't thought about that, we with photons we are not able to see the nucleus of the of the stars because the, the energy is so high that basically the photon is interacting with with everything. The, the, the density of matter and the energy is so high that the photon cannot escape. But neutrinos, as, as they do not interact with anything, they can, they can escape. So this picture here is a picture of the actual uh, nuclear reactions that are happening in the, in the nucleus of the sun. So this is the, I would say the first real demonstration, well, together with Davis, that the sun is a, is a fusion uh, reactor. So we are able to, to, see, to understand how the sun works. Of course, we don't stop here. We, well, we, the community, we want to keep uh, looking for neutrinos, and this is another of the, of the nicest experiments I know. This is uh, the top of the ice cube experiment. The ice cube experiment is a, a detector that is one kilometer cube, and this is placed in Antarctica, and it uses the, the ice in Antarctica to observe the neutrinos that interact with the ice. And this has allowed us to open a new window to the universe. It's, the, it's a real detector that is observing neutrinos coming from outside our galaxy. So with all that, uh, we have uh, we have opened a new, a new windows to the universe. We, we have the first demonstration of pieces beyond the standard model. We have win uh, several Nobel prizes. So uh, I hope that I have convinced you that neutrinos are very interesting particles that deserve to be studied. The only problem here is that usually when we want to observe neutrinos, we need to be detected with tons of materials. And it was like that until a few years ago. But uh, there is a process that allows us to don't use tons of materials, just use kilograms of materials. And this process is called coherent neutrino nucleus scattering. And this is the process where I, where I propose to, to do the, the Ganes experiment. So what happens here? If instead of using high energy neutrinos, we take uh, low energy neutrinos uh, below uh, 50 MeV or even lower, lower energies, what happens is that the wavelength associated to the neutrino uh, is large enough so the neutrino do not see the individual protons and neutrons inside the nucleus. 
but it observes the total nucleus as a whole. In this case, the cross section increases as the, as the number of neutrons to the square. For this reason, the total cross section of this process can be up to four orders of magnitude larger than the, the normal interaction of the neutrino with the, with the nucleons or even with the quarks. This interaction that you will expect that uh, being four, or, four orders of magnitude larger should be much easier to observe has been only observed four years ago. It was predicted 40 years ago and, has, and we have uh, needed uh, more than 30 years to make this observation. It was observed, observed for the first time in 2017. So the, the thing is, if we are able to observe that, again, we have a new tool to observe neutrinos, and this opens a new window for uh, understanding the physics of the neutrino. In particular, it opens the, the window to observe non-standard interactions, to study the neutrino magnetic moment, and study the nuclear structure, things that are, all of them, beyond the standard model. So uh, as this is so interesting, as the, here we, we have so many things that we can do, Let's see what we need to do to observe this process. So the first thing that we have to do is to go to a very large flux of neutrinos, of course, because even if we have a larger cross section, we still need tons of neutrinos. But those neutrinos need to be of the appropriate energy. As I said, uh, we need neutrinos that are below 50 MeV. So where we can we, where we can get that? Well, despite some sources where we, where basically we have protons hitting a target and producing neutrons. In this process, we also produce pions, and the pions decay at rest and then produce uh, muons and neutrinos. Those neutrinos happen to have the energy you know, just at, at the border to, be, to allow the coherent process. So we have uh, neutrinos with high cross-section, but at the same time, when they interact with our detector, they deposit the maximum energy that we need. And this will allow us to observe uh, better the process. So if we go to an inspiration source and we put Detectors that are order 10 kilograms, we are able, we should be able to observe this process. And that's precisely where how the first observation of this process was done. There was there is the coherent collaboration that they wanted to place uh, several kinds of detectors. And they went to the SNS price on source and they put only two of those detectors. Always it's not easy to, to build all the all those detectors. They put the cesium iodide detector and the liquid argon detector in a corridor uh, about 20 meters from the, from the target. And they were operating for five years. And that's what they observe. When the beam is off, they, they observe basically a background. But when the beam is on, they observe a clear signal above the background. And this is the first observation in 2017 uh, of the coherent process, the first time uh, this new process of the neutrino was observed. So what we propose, what we have proposed with the GANES uh, detect, with the GANES experiment, is to repeat the same but improve in every in every aspect. First of all, we want to go to the ESS, to the European Space on Source, which will produce ten times more neutrinos. This is the European Space on Source, and we what we have to do is to identify places in this in this facility where we can place uh, our detectors. The next thing that we have to do is to improve the detectors that we place uh, here so we can observe this process better. So which kind of detectors we need to exploit the physics of the process? Well, first of all, let's understand what means exploiting the physics of the process. The, what, what you can see here is the expected number of events depending for different isotopes and for different values of the neutrino magnetic mode. So as you can see, uh, most of the most of the events concentrate at, at low energies, so this will be 10 kilo electron volts. So, and most of the physics happens at one kilo electron volt. So we certainly need detectors that with a low energy threshold. But in addition, uh, the difference between the non-standard physics and the standard physics concentrates at super low energies. So ideally, we would like to reach energy thresholds up to 100 electron volts. And this is why uh, we haven't, uh, it took so long to, to observe this process because we needed to develop the technology to reach this uh, low energy threshold. In addition, an important part, uh, an important parameter to exploit this physics is the capability to play with different isotopes. As you have seen in the coherent collaboration, they have tried to operate with different technologies. Ideally, uh, what we would like to do is to operate with the same technology but with different uh, isotopes. So what you can see here is the, the region of the parameter space that we can exploit uh, related with non-standard interactions 
that we can exploit uh, operating the same detector only with Xenon, will be this, uh, this green uh, shadow area here, only with Argon for three years, the blue shadow area here, and a combination of one year and a half and one year and a half of each one of the icebergs, which is this region here, which is, as you can see, much smaller. So as you can see, the combination of different isotopes will help us exploiting the, the physics and, and being more sensitive to non-standard interactions of the quarks uh, than operating with only one isotope. So if we have a, a detector, a technique that allows us to operate with different isotopes, it will be super useful for that. So this is a, a summary of, of what I just said. Go to a, to a source of MEV neutrinos, detectors with low energy threshold, and operate with different nuclei. So how can we do that? Well, let's talk about gaseous detectors. And now is the hard part of the talk. So I'm going to talk about what happens in a, in a detector when, uh, when uh, particles cross the detector. So this is our gaseous detector. And we have here the, the atoms of the gas. In this case, it's a novel gas. So the, the molecules are uh, individual atoms. And then sometimes a, a particle, a charged particle, crosses the, the detector. This particle can do several things. One of them is to excite the atom. When it excites the atom, the, the atom stays in an excited state for a while and then decays, producing a photon. And we should be able to observe this photon. This is the first thing that a charged particle does when it crosses to uh, when it crosses a gaseous detector. Another thing that can happen is that instead of only uh, exciting, it can ionize the atom. If it ionizes the atom, then we have a free electron. And what can we do with the, with the free electron? If we are able to, to take this electron somewhere, we can read a charge signal. If not, if we don't have an electric field that allows us to extract the electron, this electron will fall down again to the atom and again produce the same light that, we, that it was producing before. So trying to summarize here, sometimes we have the detector with the positive energy. So this is an old version of the talk. And what happened is either we excite and, and okay. either we excite and produce light or we ionize. If, if uh, we ionize the detector, we either lose this information or we should be able to read this signal. And sometimes again, the electron recombines with the with the xenon atom and comes back here, producing light. So the interesting uh, thing here is that there are two sources of information, the light, the scintillation light, and the charge signal. And we should be able, we should aim for observing those two pieces of information because the more information we have, the lower energy threshold, the, be the best energy resolution and such. So how can we uh, get this information? Now let's go to a TPC. So for you that don't know, a TPC means time projection chamber, and it's a way to observe a whole, a whole volume only reading in one plane. So how does it work? This, this will be an example of a, of a TPC. This is the, the concept of the Gunness detector. And what we have to do here is we have a gas at pressure, or sometimes liquid, but gas at pressure, and we create an homogeneous electric field in all these regions. And then when a charged particle uh, arrives, it produces uh, the process that we have uh, described before. In particular, it uh, ionizes the, the cell. And then those electrons fill the, the electric field, and then they start drifting towards a region that we call amplification region. In this region, we multiply the, the signal of the electrons. How do we multiply it? Well, there are different techniques. One is by having a super large electric field in which every electron produces a cascade of electrons. But the one that we use usually is one called uh, electrominescence that I will describe uh, in the following section. Uh, and basically what we do is that every electron produces uh, hundreds of photons that are read by this plane of, of PMPs. And this process has several advantages that I, I will describe. Uh, an important part of the, of the operation with gaseous detectors is that the xenon gas has a super good energy resolution. This is the energy resolution for different densities of xenon. And as you can see here in the low part, of, in the, for low pressures, but not so low because this point here is 50 bars, the energy resolution is super good. 
when when you start increasing the, the density at some point, uh, something will happen in the gas, uh, something that we can discuss later. And the energy resolution starts uh, getting worse and worse and worse. And actually, if you see the energy resolution for liquid xenon, it is, it is much, much worse than for gaseous xenon. So the idea is that as we have uh, such a very good energy resolution here, we should aim to preserve it during the amplification process and uh, exploit this, uh, this very good energy resolution. How can we create an amplification process that does not have a, a, a bad effect on the uh, resolution? So several years ago, a group from Portugal created, uh, well, invented a process called electroluminescence that basically, uh, instead of creating a cascade of electrons, it produces a cascade of photons. So basically, you, we create a, a region where the electric field is large enough so the electrons are accelerated, interact with the xenon, and excited, but not uh, strong enough so the, the interaction with the xenon do not produce ionization. So in this process here, we produce, uh, as I was saying, hundreds of photons that are read by, by photosensors. But the good thing is that the, fluctuate, the intrinsic fluctuations of this process are uh, sub, uh, well, have an intrinsic final factor that is smaller than one, which means that we can preserve the energy resolution. And this is a proof of what I was saying. This is the operation of, uh, of different, uh, different uh, electric fields. This is the total uh, light produced. As you can see here, we start uh, not producing only light, but also producing uh, cascades of electrons, what is called uh, avalanche, uh, avalanche gain. And this curve here is the energy resolution. So as you can see, at some point, we have enough photons to, to have good uh, photon statistics, to, to have good energy resolution. But we can operate for a while in a region where the energy resolution is preserved. And when we reach the region where the avalanche is produced, the energy resolution starts degrading very quickly. So if we can operate our detectors in the region here, we can count individual electrons without uh, having, adding extra fluctuations to the process. So let's try to apply all this technology into the GANES project. So we create the TPC. Uh, with uh, well, this is the size of the TPC, so we can put uh, about 20 kilowatts, 20 kilowatts well operating at 20 bar. And then we create a plane of PNT, an amplification region based on EM. And the most important thing is that being a gaseous detector, it allows us to operate not only with xenon, but also with other gas, with other novel gases, such as argon or friton. That, as, I, as I said before, this is very important for, the, for exploring uh, new physics. But before we build this detector, we have to learn a few things about uh, how neutrinos interact with our, with our uh, atoms. And this is the, the first part of the project that we are, we are working and building here at the IPC. This prototype is called the gaseous prototype, GAP system. And this is a, a detector that should arrive in the next uh, couple of weeks. This is like it or more or less uh, this size. And what we have created here is uh, a small regions where the, the, new, the, the, active, the radioactive sources will interact in, this, in the region here. And we will create an amplification region based on electroluminescence here. And the objective of this prototype is to understand the response of nuclear recoils of different gases at different pressures. And this is fundamental because when the neutrino scatters coherently with our, with our atoms, it produces a nuclear recoil. But the energy observed in a nuclear recoil is different than the, ener the energy observed when we have an electromagnetic recoil. This difference is called a quenching factor. And as you can see here, depending on the quenching factor, we can, have, we can expect a, a very large difference on the number of events. So sometimes, if we don't understand our, nuclear of our quenching factor, we can count our number, number of events and think that we have observed new physics, but actually just have standard physics that uh, you know, we just have a, a parameter that is not well understood. Or the other, the other way around, which will be even worse. We can uh, think that we have, are measuring just a standard model, but uh, what is behind is some new physics that we cannot see because we don't understand well our detector. So this initial uh, step is fundamental so we can exploit the physics of the GANES detector. 
then what we will have to do is to, as I, as I was saying, create the GANAS detector that will have a size of uh, 60 by 60 centimeters. So it's basically tabletop uh, experiment. Apply all this technology for, for a clean amplification and such, and then take data and analyze. And of course, the detector, as I was saying, and is to be able to operate with different with different uh, gases. This is uh, you know the timeline of the project. We are right now here, but already thinking you know, on this detector. We are planning what we have to do uh, and what is the real size of the detector, the final size, where to install it, and such. And after operating it at the IPC for a while and commissioning it at the IPC, we will like we will have to install it at the at the ESS. Okay, so this was the first part of the talk uh, describing the GANES project. Let me let me go back to okay. So now we are going to move to uh, detectors based on the same technology. But in this case, instead of uh, trying to detect neutrinos, what we want to do is to observe reactions without neutrinos. So let me talk before a bit about the, about the physics uh, of the Majoran neutrinos. So the first thing that, uh, that we have to realize is that the masses of the neutrinos are very, very different from the masses of the rest of the fermions. So this is uh, the, you know, where the masses of the fermions are. Realize that this is a logarithmic scale. So between the the, the, you know, the, the lighton, which is the lightest uh, fermion, and the rest of the neutrinos, there are at least six orders of magnitude. And if you observe here, there are even if there are they span for a lot of orders of magnitude, another six orders of magnitude, most of them are you know together. So it is hard to understand this empty space here. It is hard to believe that the same mechanism to provide mass to those fermions in this region is the same mechanism that will provide mass uh, to the neutrinos. And in addition, neutrinos being a neutral particles are the only particles of the, of the standard model that could be Majorana particles. And actually, uh, some people think that if they are not Majorana particles, we'll have to explain that. So uh, how can we uh, measure, how can we determine if neutrinos are Majorana particles. Well, maybe, I, I don't know if you know, but Majorana particle is a particle that is its own antiparticle. So it's a particle that can annihilate itself. So how can we uh, say or determine if neutrinos are Majorana particles or not? Okay, let's go to uh, some special decay, which is called the double beta decay. It happens that some uh, nucleus uh, cannot decay beta because they're, they're daughter, is, uh, is more energetic because of, uh, of questions of shape of the nucleus and such. For example, in this case, moving from this end onto this cesium, it will imply a strong change on the, on the nuclear structure. So the xenon doesn't like to go there, but it wants to come here. So the only way the xenon can go to, to barium is by decaying the, by a process called double beta. And there are two kinds of, uh, of decay, of double beta decay. We, one is the one allowed by the standard model, in which it's a, a normal double beta that just happens twice in, in the same moment. And then we emit two electrons and two antineutrinos. And this has been measured in several nuclei with super long uh, lifetimes, or the 10 to 19, 10 to 21 years. But it's something that we can measure, we have observed, and we understand. And this is well understood in the standard model. A different process in the case that the neutrinos are Majorana is the neutrino less double beta decay, this one here. As I was saying before, uh, if neutrino is Majorana, it can annihilate with, with another neutrino. And this is what happens here, that in the double beta decay, the two neutrinos see each other and they annihilate. This process has not been observed, and we know that the lifetimes have to be la larger than 10 to the 26 years. But this will be another demonstration of physics beyond the standard model. So uh, you know, this is something that we want to measure. And also, uh, it allows us to, to, answer, uh, to answer some of the most relevant questions about neutrinos. So it, it will definitely uh, answer the question about, about neutrinos. It will tell us that neutrinos are Majorana. But it is also related with the mass scale of the neutrinos. And not so related, but also can uh, give us some light on the mass ordering, the mixing, and the number of species. 
right now, uh, okay. So right now, this is uh, where we are, uh, where we have our limit, and the idea is to be able to explore the whole phase space of the of the Majorana neutrinos. So being a such interesting question, what we want to do is understand again uh, what we need to do to observe uh, Majorana neutrinos. So the first thing that we have to do is to get a detector with perfect energy resolution. Okay, we know, we have the techniques to do that, or not perfect, but almost perfect. Then uh, we do the spectrum of the neutrinos and uh, only look here in the region where the electrons get all the energy. This, uh, this continuum spectrum is the energy of the, of the electrons where part of the energy is taken away by the, by the neutrinos. But in the case that the neutrinos annihilate, uh, all, the, all the energy is taken away by the light. So we just count the number of events that happens here. And then with this number of events, we come to this, uh, to this equation, and then we calculate the lifetime of the process, and we correlate it with the, the, mass, uh, the mass beta beta of the phenotype. That uh, sounds easy, right? Well, uh, sometimes it's, uh, well, in order to do that, we need to first of all select which, uh, which isotope is, uh, is good for observing this process. And there are two things that we have to, to do. One, one is uh, select the isotopes based on the phase space, the available phase space that in many of them is very similar. The only special bad uh, isotope is germanium-76. And then also based on the intrinsic uh, nuclear physics of the process, which is what we call the uh, nuclear matrix elements. And as you can see in this plot that you probably don't understand anything, uh, it's basically for every different isotope, the calculation of the nuclear matrix element for uh, different models, using the, the different models. As you can see, it's not only that you don't understand anything, we do not understand anything. The difference is so large that uh, it's still a lot of work to do here to understand if the real value is, uh, you know, is with a factor of two. And this has a clear impact also because it because we display this equation. So if at any point we have a real measurement of the time lag of the half-life, in order to move from here to here, we will really need to put a lot of effort on those calculations to really understand the physics beyond the process. But anyway, uh, this is something that we have to understand to uh, exploit the physics of the process. And now we have to, to measure. The only problem is that the, the Earth and us are very radioactive. So we have uh, more or less between three and nine grams of different uh, uranium and thorium chains in our body and in the rocks, in the, in the environment. And this, uh, these isotopes have half-lives at the level of 10 to the 10 years. If you compare with the half-life that we want to measure, mm -hmm. which is 10 to the 26, 10 to the 27, is 16, 17 orders of magnitude shorter. So even a few grams of thorium and, and uranium can kill, a, kill our experiment. So the problem of, of measuring the double beta decay is, is very, very hard. So what we have to do is uh, understand very, very well what is our radioactive, our experimental signature. The first thing, as, as I say, is understand that the energy resolution in our detector is a must. We really need to focus in this region here. And the best energy resolution, the smaller the window where we have to look, and then the less the number of background events that will fall in this window. Another thing is that the double beta decay uh, is different sometimes to the, to the environmental background. For example, in this case, uh, we can differentiate using different techniques, events, uh, you know, gamma events from alpha events, or in this case, alpha events from, from gamma electron events. So using different technologies, we can reject a background coming from the, from the wall, from the environment. And the last thing uh, that we would like to do is to tag the, the daughter ion, the, the barium in, in our case. In this case, we will have a almost background-free experiment. Once we have that, we just have to build a super radio pure detector, which means that we have to measure every piece of uh, metal and plastic that we put in our detector and take data and just explore the lifetime. Uh, this is the current status of the, of the experiments and lifetimes measure. Uh, as I said before, this is the level where we are, and this is where we want uh, to reach, but we want to reach 
in the next generation experiments. This uh, region here is led by experiments like Gerda, Kure, Kamla, uh, and EXO that are almost touching what we call the inverted uh, region of the spectrum. But in order to reach here, we need to reach this, this point, we need to, to be able to explore experiments, sorry, to build experiments able to reach half-lives at the level of 10 to 27 years, with what we call almost background-free experiments. So just to give an example of how, does, how the, the background affects our sensitivity, in the case of xenon detectors at one ton scale, uh, if we have 0.1 counts per ton per year, after operating uh, for a couple of years, we will be able to cover, to fully cover the inverted hierarchy. If instead of having 0.1 counts per ton per year, we'll have something like three or, or 10 or 10 counts, instead of uh, a couple of years, we will need almost 10 years to fully cover the, the inverted hierarchy. So clearly, the, the better is our detector on rejecting background, the more sensitivity and the faster we will explore the inverted hair. So, <clears throat> what can, you know, the idea of rejecting background very efficient is what is behind the next experiment. And this is because uh, this is the topological signature, sorry, this is the, the experimental signature of our detector. Again, energy resolution. And this is the signal of, uh, of two electrons moving into, into a gas. So if we are able to identify two electrons in our gas and differentiate that, that from a single electron, we should be able to reject most of the, of the backgrounds from gammas coming from the walls or from inside our detector uh, material. So how next works? Again, we have a TPC, and but as you will see in a second, it's a slightly different to the TPC that we need for GANES. Uh, the, when we have the TPC, we have a, an event crossing the gas. And the first thing that we that this event does is uh, scintillate. Uh, as, I say the, as I said at the beginning, uh, we have the, the scintillation light as part of uh, the information. And even if in the GANES project it was not important because uh, it was, uh, we are focusing at very low energies, for the orbital case, this is important because this uh, primary signal says the, the initial time of the event. And it allows us to situate the, the event inside the detector. Then again, those electrons uh, follow the, the electric field and reach the amplification region, where we produce also a lot of light. But a difference to, the, to what happened in the GANES detector, the, the light that is emitted for pi reaches a dense plane of, of silicon PMs here that will allow us to reconstruct the topology of the event, but also the, the light that goes backwards is raised by a plane of PMTs that the only thing that they do is to sum up the photons and integrate the total number of photons. And here is where we measure the energy. So basically what we are doing is separating the measurement of the energy from the measurement of the topology. This is just to illustrate what uh, an event looks like inside, the, inside our detector. This will be the primary scintillation, and this will be the uh, amplified signal of the electron. So as you can see, the difference is super large, but we need to design a detector that is able to, uh, to read uh, photons with such dynamic range. Okay, so once we have uh, our detector built and understood, we need to protect ourselves from uh, natural radioactivity. In order to do that, we go underground. We go to Camp Frank, which has a very nice train station that is not working. And we build a detector inside a, inside a hole that is uh, here in, in a laboratory at, uh, at one a couple of kilometers from the entrance of the tunnel and has uh, a kilometer and a half of rock on top of us. Uh, with the, this rock allow us to uh, kill most of the cosmic rays that, that will be crossing us uh, if we operate in, in surface and allow us to, <coughs> sorry, allow us to uh, remove uh, a lot of background. This is a, an image of how the, the installation can frag looks like. Our detector will be behind those electronics rack and it's not, uh, cannot see from here, I will show nicer pictures. And all this system here is similar to the one that we are installing here at the IPC, but it's basically to operate, clean, purify, emergency systems for the gas. 
the gas that is quite expensive, by the way. So in order to reach uh, Can Frank, we had been uh, working for almost 10 years. No, no, for 10 years. Uh, with different prototypes. We started with uh, Next Demo and Next uh, DVDM, which were detectors 30 by 20 centimeters that were operating in Valencia and in Berkeley. And then from the lessons learned here, we, we developed the technology and we applied this technology to, uh, with RadioPure solutions to the next wide detector at the 10 kilogram scale that has been operating in Canfranc in the last five years. Right now, we are in the process of moving to a much larger detector of about 100 kilograms of active volume, which is called Next 100. And as you will see, this detector is almost uh, built, well, or the pieces are almost built. And we are already thinking on going to the tone scale. So this is a nicer picture of demo uh, where I was not so pretty as I am now. And this is the, the demo detector operated in Valencia. But this is, these are much nicer pictures. This is the demo, the inside part of the demo detector. This is what uh, how a, a TPC looks like uh, when you don't have the vessel. <laughs> and this is all the, all the photosensors that we were using and amplification regions that we were using in the original demo detector that will allow us to test the technology. <clears throat> From there, we move to the, to the next wide detector. Again, as I, as I promised, it is a nicer picture of the detector. And of course, nicer picture from the people in this case that is nicer than me and the, the components of the detector inside. As you can see, we had to move to different kinds of PMTs. Uh, we are using radio pure copper in order to shield further our detector. Uh, we have placed a uh, we, we needed to operate almost 2,000 silicon PMs. We need to change the technology of amplification region. The size of the detector increased uh, a lot, so we need more people and more effort to, to do everything. But the good thing is that the detector worked super, super nicely for five years. And we have obtained super nice uh, things out of this detector. One of the most visual things that we can that I can show is the reconstruction of electrons. Those are real double electrons events, and this is, these are real background events. So as you can see, it is very easy to differentiate that those are two electrons because we have two blobs here from events where only one blob is, is shown. So using this, uh, this technology of topological rec uh, reconstruction, we are able to separate signal events from background events, which is a super useful extra tool in order to further uh, remove background. Applying this technology and looking into the energy region, of course, our detector is too small to observe uh, neutrino less than beta decays, but we, it is large enough to measure the two neutrino modes. And this is precisely what we did in the, well, the analysis that we did in the last year. The data took longer to, to take. Uh, what you can see here in yellow is the spectra of the uh, two neutrino modes. And an important characteristic of, of this technology is the ability of changing of changing gases. So, what uh, happens? What happens usually is that you don't understand your background at hundred percent because that will imply to measure every single screw in your detector. And sometimes you have one screw that is radioactive. So, if you just uh, take data on, with enriched uh, xenon, with you know the xenon with this isotope, and compare that with the Monte Carlo background, sometimes you don't understand anything. But being a gas detector, what, what allow us to do is to remove the xenon enriched in this isotope and put xenon that has none of this isotope. And this allow us to measure the background. So what I am showing here is, a, is an spectrum of the background. And even in this case, even if you have one screw that is uh, radioactive, it will show up in this, in this measurement. And then you just have to subtract the measurement with the, with the isotope from uh, Sorry, yeah, the measurement with the isotope, the, the background measure, measure without the isotope. We did that and we are able to show the, the measurement of the two neutrino mode, as, I, as we say, at the level of 10 to the 21 years. So, this is the summary of what we have been observed with, with demo. I just separated it by the energy measurement and the topological measurement. And with those uh, super nice results, what we need to do is to start the building the NES100. NES100 is uh, 10 times larger in volume, but only two times uh, larger in every 
dimension, but uh, in surface, it is four times larger. So it implies moving from 12 PMTs to 50 PMTs, from 4,000 silicon PMs to more, almost uh, 4,000 silicon PMs, and of course, start building uh, much larger vessels, copper uh, shielding, and, and such. So again, this is the, the, the step that we have to do. And one of the most, uh, the, the hardest part was the, the construction of copper. Up to the scale of new, we just go to the store and buy copper and then machine it. At the scale of S100, that, that doesn't work anymore. We had to go to the, to the mining company, discuss with the mining company, uh, you know, buy 15 tons of copper to, to the mine, then send it to the casting company, then send it to the forge and do the whole industrial process uh, ourselves, basically. We, we were the, the coordinators of, of this process, which was something that we never thought in, in, in advance. Uh, but the good thing is that, you know, this, this learning curve uh, is very useful for us for the next uh, generation experiment. Another important changes is that we have moved from this uh, dice board where we put the silicon PMs to this one where we have removed many layers of captain just to reduce further radio, uh, radioactivity of this part of the detector. Another thing, another changes are that we move from this uh, TPC, this is the new TPC, to uh, the new model of the NES100 TPC where we have reduced the amount of plastics, the amount of material that we have in our detector in order to reduce radio radioactivity, but also improve the operation of the detector uh, by reducing plastics and, and material inside, inside our detector. So with all these lessons learned, what we are thinking now is to go to a tone scale, what we call next HD of, of high definition. And in this case, we would like to go to a symmetric detector, but that implies to, to move, to take the, the PMTs away, and then we need to read the, the energy in a different way. Our idea is to put uh, wavelength shifting guides uh, also surrounding the cylinder and read them by silicon PMs in, the, in both ends of, a, of our detectors. In addition, we want to change the current uh, lead castle by a water tank uh, that will allow us to not only protect ourselves from cosmics, but, on low, but also observe uh, the cosmic rays and, and tag them and veto part of the, of the events that happened just after the, the cosmics. And on top of this uh, project, uh, as I said at the very beginning, we have the next bold project that is a bold idea on creating a, background, a fully background free uh, experiment where we are able to tag the barium daughter ion of the, of the xenon. When the xenon decays, it produces a barium ion. And the idea is that we have a plane, uh, sorry, a plane coated with molecules where the barium ion reaches the plane, the molecules capture the ion, the, the barium ion, sorry, and then uh, the molecule that has captured the, the ion shines in blue, while the rest of the molecules shines in, in red. So we just have to go with a laser, ask every molecule which color it is, and if we see one that is in blue, we say, okay, we have detected barium. We, this barium is correlated with an event that has the right energy, so the neutrinos are majorana. So that was it. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks. All your physics behind the detection. What is the procedure with which you can examine where the neutrinos come from? The direction in, in Gunners. Well, in general. No, <laughs> yeah. No, it is, it's different. I mean, in Gunners, no. Because the, um, the recoil energy is so small that some, I mean, our aim is to read something like two electrons. And some they will be reading like 10. But all those electrons is a, is a cloud. So it's almost impossible to have directions. There is people that is trying to observe direction there. But usually you have to go to low pressure, and then it implies less, less statistics. But in, in our case, we are assuming that we have non-direction uh, sensitivity. 
in the case of other detectors like uh, like uh, Super Cameo Can uh, and such, they can measure the, the the direction by reconstructing the the cones of, of light produced, and this is how they how they are able to see the the image of the sun. Right. You see, you mentioned that the ice cube is getting from outside the galaxy. Is that because it's when it's observing, it's observing outside the disk of the Milky Way? Uh, yeah. They. Yes. They. They have a, a map of the of the sky where they see the the source where the neutrinos are, are coming from, and they are observing neutrinos that are, you know, beta electron volts or something like that. So the the, the direction is. Quite well uh, determined, uh, quite well for for being neutrinos, <laughs> um, but yes, they, they know that they come from the outside of our galaxy. And, and what I was saying is that uh, they, I mean, basically every pixel uh, here is a, a, a region where where they when they reconstruct this circle, this circle is, is a cone. So basically, you reconstruct the vertex of the cone and you just know that the neutrinos come from this direction. And reconstructing several of those cones, you can reconstruct the. You can say, okay, I'm going to look into the sun, I'm going to look into different uh, processes. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, oh, you said that you come from the ionization of the, you know, the, 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 the atoms, so the neutrinos go through them. How energetic is ionization do you understand the position of the electrons that you are picking out so uh, okay so the, the, the question would be, would be if you are ionizing electrons from the outer orbitals then the uh -huh. emission you can get like an emission of really really low energy but if you are Ionizing electrons from the either. So, you mean if I am uh, extracting this electron or this one? Yes, basically. So, if I, uh, well, usually I extract electrons from the inner, from the inner shells. Okay. And then what I observe is a, is a gamma, is a X ray uh, that comes with the. That was the question after that. <laughs> yeah. Actually, this is one of the sources of background in the double beta decay. Uh, experiments. Can you can you use that to, to determine if you are generating barium? No. The, the X-ray the X-ray emission from the external and the barium will be different in theory. Yes, but uh, in the in the case of the, I mean the, the problem is that when you uh, generate barium, you don't have uh, X-rays. The X-rays comes when you have uh, a particle that crosses it and takes uh, takes away uh, one of the electrons. When you generate the barium, it's because you produce two electrons from here. Yeah. And then, I mean, you, you ionize the, the rest of the xenons, but uh, this, this nucleus uh, remains the same. Hey, can I understand correctly for, for NASA? Uh, your expected rate of uh, double beta decay would depend on the mass scale of electricity. Yes. And you would argue that if you get to very low backgrounds, you could even start uh, touching or even moving out inverted care. Mm -hmm. So, my question is that I think there are like you know, evidence from cosmological uh, data that, uh, that there's a preference for the normal care, right, which maybe would be the mass scale like up to you know, three or so uh, smaller. So, assuming that the, the care is normal, you, you think you could eventually even measure some. Uh, a okay. In this room, we know that the, that the hierarchy is normal. Okay. <laughs> but um, so when Heider K and other experiments determine a lab and not only from cosmology that hierarchy is normal, uh, we still have all this line here. So even if we put a, a cross line at this level, uh, we will uh, know that uh, we will still have all this region to explore okay so all the region what we call uh, the, the degenerate region we it is it is always interesting even if we keep low uh, going down it is still interesting 
Uh, of course, if we want to do the same for the normal hierarchy than for the inverted hierarchy, we, we need to reach this point here. And this is, uh, this is a nice challenge for, my, for the students of my students, probably. Uh, we are talking about multi-tone detectors, background free, operating for 10 years. So, uh, to reach that, either we have a technique uh, like barium tagging or similar, and uh, a funding of uh, more than a billion or at least a billion, American billion. Or, I mean, the, the experiments at this level for, you know, the, the quotations that some experiments are, are giving to make an experiment of one ton for 10 years is 400 million. If we want to go here, it's going to be at least a couple of videos. And, but this is the easy part. I mean, money is the easy part. We need to create new technologies to, to tie the value to have background C, uh, experiments in autonomous material. We are talking about you know, this room full of, uh, of xenon. Zero background. So it's uh, again, I am happy that my students think about that. Thanks a lot again. Two weeks the next one, but I have to admit I don't know. Yeah. Muy bien, te presento. Está muy interesada por un estudiante y terminó la carrera que viene a ver una charla de cine y ciencia. Ah, vale. No sé si te pongo en contacto. Eh, te que presenté con, la cosa con que no, no, sí, sí, sí. el día anterior lo hice en Vitoria y estaba ella. Me hizo un ah, montón de preguntas. Si sí, 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 te lo comenté, sí, sí, vale. Bueno, francés, no, yo la verdad que no. Estaba haciendo un montón de preguntas y no sabía contestar. No voy a preguntar. Yo no entendí lo que has dicho, lo de lo de mañana. Sí. De hecho, que se alquilan dos partículas. Sí. Gracias. Hasta luego. A mí no me cuadra, o sea, ¿por qué? ¿Cómo, cómo puede ser eso? Que se me quedan las partículas. Sí. A ver, tú te Pero de iguales, ¿no? Son, no digo que no son antipar, la antipartícula y la partícula, ¿no? Claro, es que el, el truco de que, de que una partícula sea de más llana es que, que son al mismo tiempo partícula y antipartícula. Ah, claro, es el truco de mayorana. Sí. O sea, la pregunta aquí, la pregunta de esa mayorana es: digamos, tú coges un electrón y, y dices, vale, la antipartícula es el electrón, positrón. Y es muy fácil. Porque cambia la carga. O sea, tú sí, una sí, sí. campo eléctrico y va para allá, otra va para allá. Mm. Ya está. Hay de un neutrino. Vale, ¿Cuál es la diferencia entre un, entre un neutrino y un antineutrino? ¿En qué curso estás? Yo he acabado la carrera. He acabado la carrera. ¿Pero has dado teoría de cuantía de campos? No. Ya, es que los, los niños de hoy en día no saben nada. Y yo no me acuerdo nada. Entonces, no me acuerdo nada. No, no bueno, a ver. En teoría de cuantía de campos eh, hay una cosa que se llama quiralidad, ¿no? O elicidad, si quieres, ¿vale? Resulta que las interacciones débiles, claro, no me quería meter ahí porque bueno, acabamos y ya no entendéis nada, con lo cual, o sea, estamos todos igual. Eh, las interacciones débiles violan paridad 100%. Eh, violan paridad y, y conjunción de carga 100%. Es decir, no puedes. Eh, 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 ¿Cómo digo esto? Eh, las partículas siempre interactúan la parte del debo gira, ¿vale? Es decir, de, si, si, un, si un electrón está girando a, eh, destructivamente, sí. no ve la interacción débil. Para que tengas una idea de lo loco que es esto. ¿vale? Vale. Es que pasa, el neutrino solo se produce por interacciones débiles. Entonces, el neutrino siempre es lebogir. Claro. El antineutrino siempre es destrógir. ¿vale? Pero eso es la única diferencia que hay entre el neutrino y el antineutrino. A priori. ¿vale? Entonces, si no tienes más el neutrino, no pasa nada. Eso está bien. Ok, no, no, no bah, da igual. Porque tú nunca vas a poder adelantar al neutrino. Para que imagínate que un neutrino que está girando así, ¿vale? Bueno, en realidad eso se llama un antineutrino, ¿vale? Y ahora tú coges y es un antineutrino que se ha producido en una reacción nuclear, por ejemplo, un antineutrino. Va girando así. Y ahora tú coges con una nave espacial y lo adelantas. Porque como el neutrino tiene masa, no se mueve la velocidad de la luz. Por lo tanto, lo puedes adelantar. ¿Vale? En el momento en el que lo adelantas, el neutrino sigue girando así, pero en lugar de ir para allá, va para allá. Y ahora es una partícula de gira. Pasa de ser una partícula de estrógira 
Es una partícula levófila. ¿Pero por qué? ¿Por qué pasa así? Por un cambio de coordenadas. Es la misma partícula. Pero tú, como observador desde fuera, dices, esta partícula es una partícula... Ah, vale, eso, eso depende del punto de observación. Digamos, eh, tú, digamos puedes, pensar, puedes imaginarte que esto puede pasar. Vale. Y, y de hecho, si tú, si tú ves en Lagrangiano eh, el término de masa de Higgs, bueno, el término de masa en general, el término de masa es lo que te hace es conectarte la parte levófila con la parte extrógena. El término de masa es M, R, o sea, Phi, R, Phi, L. Es el término de masa de Lagrangiano en el modelo estándar. Que lo que te está diciendo es que la masa es lo que conecta la parte levófila con la parte, parte extrógena con la parte levófila. Es lo que te conecta esta, estos dos términos. Porque es lo que te permite adelantar las partículas. ¿Vale? En el caso del neutrino, tenemos un, un neutrino que es levógiro, o sea, que es destrógeno y para ser levógiro. ¿Qué pasa? Que tú, de repente, estás en tu nave espacial y dices, hostia, una parte, un neutrino eh, levógiro es un neutrino. Pues, sí, ese hace un minuto era un antineutrino. Entonces la pregunta es, ¿eso es así tal cual? Es decir, ¿es la misma partícula? Simplemente se diferencia en, en el flip, de, digamos, en la orientación del spin. O hay algo más. Es, es que esa, ese, esa partícula, en cuanto se vuelve eh, de extrógira, deja de interactuar con el universo. Porque lo que ocurre en el modelo estándar es que si tú tienes una, un neutrino de extrógira, no hay forma de verlo. Y lo que es peor, si esa partícula existe, ¿cómo se ha producido? Pues no lo ves que no se puede producir. Entonces, por, eso decía, por eso he dicho así muy brevemente que, que hay gente que piensa que si el neutrino es mayor gana, tenemos que buscar la forma de explicarlo. O sea, no, no es que tengamos que explicar que no, por qué el neutrino mayorana, no al revés. ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo consigues que el neutrino no sea mayorana? Vale, pero claro, de momento, o sea, esa es otra pregunta. Eso, eso es cuando ya nos den el premio Nobel por haberlo descubierto, entonces ya nos plantearemos eso. Pero según lo que, según lo que acabas de comentar, no es que el neutrino cambie, ¿no? Sino que tú, como observador... Bueno, te he puesto un ejemplo para que lo entiendas. Ah. Pero, eh, digamos, en, en la desintegración nuclear lo que ocurre es yeah. que efectivamente el neutrino, por ese término de masa, por eso yeah. el término de masa está yeah. en la cuestión de la vida media, tiene que hacer un flip. Yeah. Tiene, tiene que cambiar su spin en el proceso. ¿vale? Esto, eh, digamos, esto se entiende bastante bien si tú, por ejemplo, observas la desintegración del pion. El pion se desintegra a muones y a electrones, ¿vale? Y tú podrías pensar, bueno, el pion está aquí, el muón está aquí y el electrón está aquí. Tiene mucho más eh, espacio de fase para que haya electrón, ¿vale? Sin embargo, tú miras la vida media yendo a muón y yendo a electrón, va siempre a muón. Casi siempre. Y dices, ¿por qué? Si tiene la dinámica, o sea, si tienes mucha más energía, tienes que caerte debajo. Bueno, el problema es que para que esto pueda ocurrir, emite, digamos, cuando se va a muón, emite un, un muón y un, anti, y un, y un neutrino antimuónico, ¿vale? El problema ahí es que el muón tiene que cambiar, o sea, de nuevo, interacción débil. Las dos partículas tendrían que ser, eh, o sea, no, no, no puedes conservar spin, porque el, el pion tiene spin cero. Para conservar un momento no puedes conservar spin. Entonces, eh, uno de los, una de las partículas tiene que cambiar su líquida, ¿vale? En el caso del muón, como tiene mucha masa, la cambia fácil. Vale, pues tengo mucha masa y me da igual ir para allá, o sea, voy despacito por el mundo, me da igual ir para allá que ir para allá, para que cambia fácil. En, cambio, en el caso del electrón, ¿no? Le cuesta mucho más cambiar ese, ese líquida. Y, y por eso la vida media del pion a electrón tarda mucho. Pues imagínate, en lugar de ir a electrón, ir a, ir a neutrinos. Claro, la vida media se te dispara. Ver, pero el proceso, digamos, la idea conceptual es la misma. Tienes un, una desintegración, que es una desintegración débil, por tanto, viola CP, pero CP 100%, y necesitas algo que cambie esta electricidad. Ese cambio de electricidad es lo que hace que las vidas medias vayan con la masa. ¿Vale? Todo esto no me tiempo a contar. ¿eh? <risa> Yeah, yeah. Qué bien. Bueno, ¿Sí? ¿Te bueno, ha pasado bueno. bien? Sí, sí, sí. Vale, sí, vale. sí. sí a ver, ¿verdad? Si sí, pues habrá un poquito del detector, de fotos, tal. Sí, no está muy ah, bien. Sí, sí. Sí, bueno. Nos queda un poco de rabia que la gente no vale. Ya, yeah. yo es que no he venido a ninguna, de hecho, porque no, no me ha quedado aquí nunca. Ya. Yeah. ¿Sabes? Pero es verdad que, bueno, sí. yo creo que habría que poner café. Yo o sea, café creo, ahora se lo, se lo escribe, sí, se lo escribiré a. ¿Y sabes qué estaba pensando ahora? Igual poner dos en una hora. De dos temas más. diferentes, así que ya tienes dos grupos que ya, se, que van, van, a ir, se van a ir ya. una vez al mes con pinchos después. No veo. Ahora se le, le escribo a Ricardo. O si no, dos, por lo menos, forzar la gente que sea corta, pero que haya discusión después. Que haya, por ejemplo, esto que claro. haya que sea después. Sí. Y que al ¿sabes? final sí. Entonces, y los, la, y la, los la pinchos, semana pasada que hicimos un encuentro con una astrónoma que vino de visitos, si no, 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 no
para Inspiring Careers. Ah, sí, llamamos. sí, me pilló en... en que vinieron a los de tu grupo, los conocí. Ah, no, sí, 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 además está súper... La, la mujer está una, una máquina, o sea, tenía sí. el currículum, mirad, una sí. máquina. Sí, y sí. ella vino y hablamos... Y vino mucha gente, pero claro, la idea de luego es que había el pincho, eso tiraba, claro, claro, eso claro, tiraba claro. un montón. Porque dice, me paro por ahí, tal, <risa> sí, sí. sí, hay que, estos físicos, pues físicos, físicos sí, claro, sí, claro. Esto pasa en todas partes, ¿eh? Sí. En, en Fermila, por ejemplo, los viernes tienen el Cheese and Wine Seminar. Sí. Y en, en Los Ángeles tenían el Pizza Seminar, claro, pero el sí. Pizza Seminar es más, más gay, porque esta gente... Realmente comiendo pizza mientras sí. tú la charla, ¿sabes? Ostras, que a mí no me importa, ¿eh? Si no, no, no de comer pizza antes... Hola, no perdón, antes de que se me olvide. Vale, gracias. No. Bueno, no, sí, sí, pero yo creo que un <coughs> pincho seminario yo lo veo bien. ¿eh? Sí. Lo veo además que necesario. Sí. Porque no, sí, hay que saber claro, que la cultura no, no. local. Sí, sí. Y si por razón de baño todo lo que sea, no se puede dos veces al mes... Que se haga una vez al mes por lo menos. Claro, y que sea... y igual sea una charla, no sé, de media hora cada una, o igual estamos una hora y cuarto, y luego ya se sigue hablando afuera. Sí, sí, sí. Haciendo como estamos haciendo, pero con un pincho, bajo sí, sí, los sí, dientes, sí. ¿no? Hombre, algo más de vidilla, claro. Sí. Y no, además es que yo creo que eh, rompes un poco más la barrera, ¿sabes? Porque sí. si estás pincho, pues aquí estaría el resto de la gente, estás aquí y, claro. y a lo mejor alguien se ha quedado con las ganas de preguntar o se ha quedado claro. con las ganas de una tontería, no sé qué, o sí. coméntame más, no sé cuánto. Sí. Eso, sí, perfecto. Lo, claro. lo pregunto. Sí, sí, ya se lo comentaron. Oh, Muy bien. Eh... Ah, voy a decir algo a los chicos. Eh, sí, sí. a los. Madre mía. No, no te